谁同意？谁反对？这个李天明，郭露，嗯，不知道。Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, just waiting a few minutes to let everyone in.、Um, I had a few emails、uh, with students that had difficulties accessing Moodle, so I've been sending the link、um, directly to them. So we're going to just for today give a few minutes, so everybody has a chance to join. In the meantime, you would have seen the link、um, for. For today's session slides, I can share it on the on the chat as well. If you haven't seen it, or if you don't have access to to Moodle, so you can follow at your own pace. Or if you have difficulties、um, with the internet connection, that's the link.、Um, and I'll be recording today's session.、Um, I assume that there might be some people even. Listening to this、uh, when it's really, really late and they're really tired,、uh, and the last thing you want to do is to listen to a methods lecture. So、uh, you can do it tomorrow morning.、Uh, it will take a while to upload and for me to be able to share the link, but hopefully by this afternoon I'll be able to do that. So give everybody a few more minutes.、Uh, And then we'll probably start at o five. If you want me to, if you can send me a message on the chat saying、uh, or indicating whether you had trouble accessing Moodle, that will give me an indication of、um, the scale of the problem, whether it's、uh, a minority or whether we're dealing with something.、Uh, Uh, really serious. Yes, this lecture will be recorded and uploaded to Moodle、uh, as soon as I'll start. I hit the record record button. We don't want to have the first few minutes of、uh, nothing happening, but I'll do that. And if I don't, please remind me. You should see a recording button somewhere. So, also an indication in terms of Moodle, you will find this course 
as mentioned or written as research methods too. So there is, I know that there is another, another like Moodle holder called dissertation, and that's not it. Um, and I've been asked to use research methods too. So if you find that Moodle is working for most of your courses and you haven't had, uh, and you were looking at this course under dissertation, that might be the problem. Right, let me see if I can change the... <laughs> oh, there's a one. Right. We'll just try to make a start and I will probably stop in a few minutes to let the rest of you in. Um, I'll start recording now. Recording in progress. And I'll start sharing my screen. Right. Well, welcome everybody, everybody that managed to get the link to join. Uh, we are about 140, so we got uh, substantial drainage, um, but I'm sure we'll um, manage to sort it in the, for, for the next week. Uh, and as I said before, I'm recording this uh, and I will upload the link to this presentation, the video recording um, to Moodle on the research methods to holder. Um, so make sure that if you don't have access to Moodle that you uh, try to sort uh, access this week. If not, do email me and at least I can send you informally the links until you, you, you're set up. My name is uh, Leo Minuchin. I've been teaching at the MSA for about a decade. Um, I sit at the U of M side. My background is in urban studies and I mainly do research on politics and construction in South America. And I've lately been working on issues of infrastructures and logistics and popular logistics in South America. Uh, I've taught methods uh, at the EMARC level for a couple of years and I've also done and organized the methods course um, for the PhD students at SEED at the U of M side. So in a way, what we're gonna to try to cover in this set of sessions 
uh, is almost the uh, the underpinnings and the principles and the mechanics and the tactics that you should deploy to construct and develop your dissertation. Uh, and it, in a way, it's an attempt to give you the basic tools. It will be quick. Uh, um, so, you know, we always struggle with the amount of time we have to actually give you proper training in terms of uh, understanding the basics of how you develop a research design. But in a way, in a span of about four to five weeks, you should be able to develop your own research design, understand how you justify your research questions, how do you develop a research design, and how do you select the ways by which you're gonna gather the information that you need to answer the research questions that you are um, trying to to tackle. Now, one of the key things that we're going to try to do today is to start to distinguish between what is research from other forms of, of um, observation or opinion or essay writing. And I particularly want to distinguish uh, something that sometimes students at the MARC level struggle with, which is the difference between design proposal and design definitions and research. We're gonna complicate things because fortunately, and I think that's the strength of architecture, there's things that, that we can call research by design. But what I really wanna put an emphasis on is that you are not supposed to offer a design solution to the research problem that you're tackling. So I wanna make a clear distinction between what is research and what is design, uh, because you're, all of you would be super accustomed to producing portfolios um, uh, for, for your ateliers and to tackle the problem, but the way you solve a problem that you identified within your atelier is not the same way you tackle the problem for your dissertation. The warning that does not mean that we are not looking for a heavily visual um, piece of research. Uh, the dissertation will be supported by a substantial amount of visual material uh, that could be plants, drawings, pictures, uh, uh, renderings, your own diagrams, but it's not a design solution to the problem that we're looking in the dissertation. So we structure the methods course in six sessions that will span from September to January. Uh, those sessions are almost structured as each of the components by which we're gonna assess your dissertation. So we're gonna look at the integrity of the research design. We're gonna look how well you manage to situate your research design with the existing literature, the academic literature. We're gonna examine how robust and appropriate the tactics by which you collected data were deployed and selected. We're gonna examine how well written your dissertation um, is, and, but also how logical the progression of the argument is of your dissertation. And then we're gonna look at your ability to mobilize visual material to support your writing and how we're going to talk a little bit towards the end of, of the sessions, not, not today, but in January of how well referenced and how academically sound that piece of writing is. So that's a very rapid overview of, of the sessions. Now, what we changed slightly this year is there's a clear overlap between the lectures that support the almost, um, that give you the underpinnings of uh, your research uh, project with your individual work in terms of your research project. So you're going to have the lectures. That's the top row that you see here. But from the end of October onwards, you're going to be um, selecting a research group between five and six students that has a set of themes that organizes that group in which you're gonna select your own research project. So dissertations are individual, even though you're gonna be working within a research group and your, the feedback is gonna be one-to-one -one in a way. Huh? So your research design is not a collective research design for the group, it's individual. 
And so after you're allocated to that um, research group that has a set of themes, uh, you're gonna have uh, a series of eight, at least eight tutorials with that supervisor. We're gonna get to the themes that the supervisor are inter supervisors are interested in um, having and producing this year. Uh, and we strongly encourage you to start building your own diary or um, notebook about the possible ideas, the possible themes that you'll be most interested in to then start to see how they could possibly align with the broad research theme uh, that the supervisors will offer. So the supervisors will not be uh, offering direct research dissertation topics. They will be giving a broad theme, right? A set of processes, nodes, concerns, uh, and in which we think at least most of you will be able to uh, situate your own interest. Um, so today, I wanted to give a brief overview of what we understand and what we can understand as a dissertation. Uh, and to start to get to grips of what is distinct about academic research. So what makes it different from simple observation or an opinionated essay, for example. So what is it different uh, from academic research and uh, how can we distinguish it from you basically uh, giving an writing an opinion uh, as a form of essay, which is potentially something that you would have been used to uh, at an undergraduate level. And I always like to start the first session uh, by a controversial, uh, uh, and I think one of my favorites, kind of epistemologists, or someone that is devoted to studying how we produce knowledge uh, and the value and the validity of that knowledge. So the question as to how we construct something that we deem to think that is true. So how, how what are the principles of uh, something being true or false and how do we produce that knowledge is something that epistemologists do. And Feyer Rabin was what is called an anarchic epistemology, uh, kind of um, militant in a way. And it's not like he didn't have a method. It's not like he didn't uh, uh, believe in methods. It's that he was really interested in, from the beginning, questioning the, the, the parameters and the conditions under which we produce that knowledge. And in a way, in the first sessions, what I want you to start thinking about is that the decisions you make about what you're gonna research and how you're gonna research a topic are never innocent, are never um, neutral. They are uh, surrounded and they are situated within a context where your beliefs, your positionality, your conceptual framework impacts the way you even frame your research questions. So decisions as to how you even pose a problem are underpinned by the way you even first constructed that problem in the first place. And so Feyerabend points to this issue that we need to democratize and make those uh, processes by which we select our research problems and name them visible, open. He calls it democratic. We're not necessarily going to engage in an assembly about how uh, um, uh, well you select your research topic and, and, and how appropriate your methods are, but what you will see throughout, particularly in the first semester, is your you being challenged by your supervisor, by your peers, by your group, um, potentially by me, as to what are the assumptions that you are bringing in to your research problem? How you are naming certain phenomena, how you are engaging with your problem, what are you selecting and what are you neglecting when you do that? And there is another, for me, well, He's a sociologist, but he's also an epistemologist, uh, Buenaventura de Sousa from Portugal. When he puts an emphasis on how political 
that decision about what knowledges we uh, respect and what knowledges we neglect are. And in a way, we want you to start being uh, aware of how the selection of certain conceptual frameworks could be uh, uh, put to reproduce certain patterns of discrimination, fragmentation, or occlusion of certain other knowledges. And this is very clear, for example, when we look at issues of col col colonialism, uh, gender dynamic, racial discrimination, that the voice and the authors and the conceptual frameworks that we might be mobilizing are organized to potentially ignore certain other dynamics. And when you start crafting your own research design, when you select the positionality that you're gonna put in place to actually engage with your research topic, this is really important. So another thing that we would always want you to start doing when you select a problem is to ask yourself to reflect upon where am I looking this problem from? Am I not ignoring a certain point of view? Am I not reproducing a certain way of naming certain uh, processes? Let me give you an example that Buenaventura uses. So to make it clear. So he looks at um, political transformations in the Southern Cone, in Latin America, in Bolivia, in Ecuador lately. And he basically understands that a lot of the governments in the second half of the 20th century have appropriated notions of development that were coming from what he refers to as the global north. And that a lot of policies were built around notions of development that had a particular definition of what, for example, environmental dyna dynamics meant and how growth would be valued in opposition to other ways of considering the environment and nature. For example, the ones held by the indigenous community. But when he's talking about uh, that other knowledges are possible, he's thinking that, well, other forms of development were possible. Um, uh, and so he rescues in his work uh, alternatives to thinking about economic relations by understanding other ways of under considering nature, for example. But he thinks that at the heart of that problem is the issue of um, uh, almost epistemological differences and epist different epistemological backgrounds. So the exclusion, oppression and discrimination that capitalism produces have not only economic, social and political dimensions, but also cultural and epistemological ones. And remember we said epistemological means how we produce knowledge. Uh, how do we establish uh, truth values? To confront this paradigm in all its dimension is the challenge facing critical theory and new emancipatory practices. So he's even thinking that doing research in a certain way has the potential uh, to introduce um, important social transformation. Now, I'm not gonna say that your dissertations are gonna change the world. I'm not gonna say that, you know, you should basically seek to use, uh, and use your dissertations as a uh, the starting point of emancipatory projects. But what we do want you to think about your dissertation is not just an attempt to fulfill an ROBA criteria to obtain your masters of architecture. That we hope, uh, or at least I hope that the skills that you learn through your dissertation project become transferable skills. We think that you're gonna be exposed and potentially that you could use your research skills in future practice, not, not only in architectural practices, but if you were thinking of doing things in social policy, in urban policy, in planning, uh, if you were thinking about slightly changing careers, but that will demand research. And I think allowing yourself a little bit of time of how basically research works and not just 
being obsessed by finishing your dissertation uh, potentially could be of use uh, for the future. So in this sense, I think uh, when Ian Borden and I, like a caveat, you know, a lot of the books that I'll be mentioning, I try to select books that are available online through at least the University of Manchester uh, library. So you should be able to, to have a look at them uh, directly uh, as an ebook. Um, of course, they are available in, in hard copy, uh, and I'm sure they, there's availability of MMU. Um, he says, words too are an integral part of what architecture is all about. Architecture is textual as well as visual and spatial. And I think this is important in the sense that, and it starts to put us in a position of trying to start to distinguish between research and design. <laughs> and not because they are two completely separate um, and isolated dimensions, but they entail different uh, processes and outputs, uh, but they're connected. Uh, and we hope that a lot of your design decisions and tactics will be eventually underpinned by research. Now, the dissertation that we are asking you to produce doesn't necessarily contain both dimensions. Some of you will have a much more, um, uh, uh, because of your research design, a, a higher component of evaluating design decisions by someone else. For example, if you are examining the work of a certain architect in a certain period, it will be clear that you will be relying on their design decisions to actually substantiate your uh, research um, project. But we are not asking you even, let's say that you are looking at um, uh, limitations or deficits in uh, um, social housing typologies in a certain period in a certain country. We are not asking you at the same time to provide an alternative. Your dissertation should not be the solution to social housing typology if you were doing that. The solution is, we are not asking you for a solution. Yes, sir. We are asking you to actually do research on what is the existing yes, limitation uh, of, in that case, uh, social housing typologies or social housing provision. Uh, I hope the distinction becomes clear as, as we go, as we move forward. People in the waiting room, sorry. So how do we start <laughs> to distinguish um, between design and research? Well, I like th th this um, Groats kind of attempt to start to distinguish both and Groats and uh, Wang's book, which is quite famous in architectural research is available online and, and you, you can look at it in the ebook um, uh, as an ebook from the University of Manchester Library. One of the things that they point to design is that it is generative, meaning that it is propositional, that it acts upon an intervention to solve and address a problem. Research is basically an attempt to understand, describe, uh, explain, depending on your methodology, why certain processes are taking place and the implications so, of certain decisions or uh, policies or design tactics. But it's not necessarily generative. And that's kind of a key distinction that they pose. Because in a way, what you're trying to do with research is to isolate and try to address a certain problem, a certain object, of research. Now that becomes already a problem in itself. You know, we don't want to get too philosophical about it, but how do we define an object of research is a contested uh, problem in itself, right? So for example, if you would have asked Tafuri, uh, the very famous architectural critic, Italian architectural critics, prolific in the 70s, uh, key member of the Venetian school, 
to understand how can we understand the production of certain architectural forms, he would say, well, you cannot disentangle those forms from the existing socioeconomic structures. Yeah, so the way we understand the emergence of certain typologies has to do, for example, with economic, this, the unfolding of economic uh, forms of production. Right? So, for example, but another one, um, let's say Frampton, another architectural critic might say, well, no, no, no. In order for us to start to understand and address an object of research, for example, we need to look at how certain co tectonic cultures evolve, how practices of building and construction uh, evolved and changed in order to situate an emergent phenomenon within a wider cultural context. But you see, they might be looking at the same building, the same architect, the same set of buildings or a policy, but the way they actually define that problem of research that might arise by looking at that project or even how they contextualize that architect object of research is completely different. And that has to do with the way they understand how the real is built. And that has to do with your conceptual framework. So one of the key things that you're gonna be looking at uh, when, we, uh, when you select your um, dissertation group is that the themes that they propose are underpinned by conceptual frameworks. I'm making things up because I haven't seen the full list uh, for this year, but there might be some that actually uh, look at exclusively at materiality, but others look at environmental dynamics uh, as a key kind of conceptual um, starting point. So it is important that you start to negotiate a little bit, not only what you're interested in, but how you're gonna look at that object of research in order to then read the group list by saying, oh no, hang on a minute. I think that that person might be important or might help me to build my conceptual framework because I agree or I'm interested in furthering my understanding of that set of theoretical um, contributions in order to support my dissertation. So if we start to approach and to, uh, to kind of ask what, what is a dissertation, how we can uh, um, understand what we're gonna ask you to do, the first thing that you need to understand is that it's an individual piece of research. You will develop your question. You will develop your research design. You will develop the set of tactics that you're going to deploy to collect information. And, it's, and it differs from the other bits of writing that you would have done by how systematic and rigorous the collection process of data, the analysis of the data, and the the way you start to align claims with support of evidence. Right. So it's not an opinion, it's not a, a report, it's not a, a mere or simple description. It, ha it contains a different level of abstraction and complexity. Why would we want to write a dissertation apart from trying to annoy you or to really obstruct your studio work and make life really difficult for year five. That's something we really cherish uh, and enjoy. Um, it's because we think that it could be fundamental for, as a set of skills, basically. We think that, that basically to think yourself as an architect without being able to conduct research will really limit you. And at the same time, it provides a set of skills that will be useful even if you are not asked to do or write another substantial piece of research because you will need to engage in practice regardless of the type of practice that you're in in data gathering in evaluating the um, consistency and quality of the data that you might be exposed to in being able to synthesize that data to extract key trends or to uh, understand regularities or transformations or disruptions uh, and to also manage um, stages of gathering 
analyzing and reporting on that data. Uh, so it's a lot of time management that is involved in writing a dissertation uh, to completion in the time that actually we um, provide you with. And those are skills that you're going to use, not just for the dissertation, but hopefully in practice as well. And so one of the things that we will try to do in, the, in these sessions, before you even get to writing your own dissertation, is to break down each of these stages, right, from the... This, the setting up of your research design as an engine to generate new knowledge and to, set, to allow you to um, be critical about the way you're going to select the data that's going to support your uh, research design and to how you analyze it and how you write it. How do we distinguish research from other forms of observation? And to put it bluntly, it has to do with the levels of systematization and the depth of inquiry. Embedded in the notion of research, there's an understanding of a certain definition as to how you are proposing that you're gonna validate your claims. What do I mean by this? The dissertation will not hold if you say, I think this is great or I think this was a wonderful idea because it made people happy. Well, we, have, we don't care, basically. We want to know how you're going to support that claim. And we want to even know in the introduction how you're thinking that the way you're going to support those claims makes it a valid claim. So for example, are you going to use a survey? Are you going to contextualize th that assertion with, um, the collection of key people's uh, positions on a certain design? Are you gonna look at any historical frameworks of how that decision changed over time to support that claim? You see, so embedded within the dissertation is an understanding of how you're going to support your claims. So a dissertation has supported claims, supported truth claims. And in order to support those claims, you need to provide evidence. Evidence can come in a multiple of ways. So it can be, as I said, um, interviews, it can be from surveys, it can be from archival research, it can be by visual analysis of uh, versions of drawings, it can be by photo elicitation and getting people to talk about certain uh, prompts, it can be about uh, the analysis of transformation of maps, GIS, and that evidence we will look at can be of multiple sorts, but what we cannot have in the dissertation are unsupported claims. So that's one thing that we really look at is how well you manage to support your claims. Now, because this is a master's dissertation and it's not a PhD dissertation, sometimes we, uh, we we stress to students that we are not going to push you to provide exclusively primary sources to support your claims. So we will tolerate and accept your reliance on what's called secondary literature, which we will look at. So what other people have said about the same topic or the same question of research that, that you might be addressing, that we will absolutely tolerate. One way to strengthen the support and the validity of those games is by something that we call triangulation. For example, if we were saying that there were certain, um, to, or we were trying to address the negative implications of gentrification in certain boroughs of London in the last 15 years, we will not only rely on the evolution of rent prices, but perhaps we can complement that analysis by bringing in interviews of displaced communities together with, for example, new house prices in the same area in the same period. And in addition to that, relaxation of planning laws that might have accelerated that process. So you see, you triangulate, you combine sources to strengthen the validity of a certain claim. 
that is something that we encourage you to do in the dissertation. So in a sense, not just to rely on one single source to then generalize and, and, and make it potentially a bigger claim that you can. So one of the things I always try to suggest to students is much better to reduce the, um, the scale of your claim to make it a smaller claim, but much better supported. So in terms of research, if we had to create an imaginary scale of complexity and systematization, we go on one side on the left, or at least my left, on what is a casual observation, something that we might see and reflect upon seeing things on the street, to potentially then moving on to more slightly more systematic forms of observation. So potentially we chron chronicle the evolution of an event. But of course, it comes um, an instance of design. So perhaps by repeating that forms of observation and the chronicling of that event, we might be able to come up with a design solution to something that we might turn out to be then a manifest of how we can tackle a certain problem or intervene or address a certain phenomenon. There might be, because we looked at different sources and looked at different opinions, we can then potentially produce and understand the size of the argument, we can produce an essay. That could then, if we move further down the scale through a design perspective, that could lead to a design prototype because the design prototype contains um, uh, stages of experimentation and discarding failures. So we observe our own design and evaluate um, the differences and then we are able to develop a prototype. I would say that I wouldn't necessarily, if the prototype is well researched, I wouldn't necessarily distinguish in terms of systematization between the prototype and the social sciences, but this is more or less what we are asking you to do. In a sense, with the social sciences, you systematize an observation, you develop uh, methodological tactics or methods to gather data, to triangulate sources, to support a claim, to support an argument. So we go from a casual observation that is unsupported, it's your personal view, to something that is supported by evidence, organized in a systematic way, that it can be repeated, that observation can be repeated by someone else. So if, if you give, if you produce this, robust scientific research, you should, someone else should be able to repeat that piece of research. A casual observation, we cannot do that, right? Because it's my own observation, my individual observation. It's my individual point of view. There are different ways that we can um, think about the purpose of research. Um, so why do we do research? What's, what's it for? What, is it, what can allow us uh, to find out? And I'm taking these definitions from uh, Levy. And again, the book, the link to the book is uh, quoted here. And these are the different, you know, I think we can expand it, but roughly speaking, it gives a nice description of how we can use a mobilized research. The first stage that we can use research for is exploration. We have a phenomenon that has not been um, properly research, for example, the implication of COVID in urban design. We have, you know, it hasn't been fully researched. We need to explore that. Uh, for example, the, um, uh, is the, if there is a correlation between the pandemic uh, in certain countries, loss of jobs and uh, evictions, maybe you know, making things up, but that hasn't been researched. It's a new phenomenon and it's worth exploring in a systematic fashion. Another dimension of research is could be a descriptive. And these are all forms that you can frame your dissertation, right? So getting you to start thinking, okay, no, I would like to describe certain phenomenons, activities, practices uh, through what Gretz called, he was an, an anthropologist, a thick description. 
his most famous kind of descriptions were in a bazaar, in markets, right? So from your point of view, and I know Ray Lucas, for example, has done similar things from a design perspective, but taking to analyze markets in, in South Korea, you can start describing processes, describing practices, describing ways of designing, describing ways of building, um, patterns, for example, processes, disruptions, continuities in time. Uh, so for example, the, you, you can describe the increasing financialization of uh, housing in the UK. You can look at Rolnick's book on urban warfare. And she basically describes by looking at changes in planning regulations and policy and housing policies, how increasingly the production of housing is linked to uh, the, the inclusion of financial instruments. Right? And, she, and she then describes the implication, but first she describes how that process took place. And it needs a thick description. One of the things that I want you to keep in mind, even if we, you know, this is completely new for some of you, is that each way of addressing what your dissertation will be doing, so what you think the purpose or the ultimate aim of your dissertation will be, whether you're going to try to explore a new topic or describe, sometimes you can combine, explore and describe, will potentially require certain methods of ways of collecting data and not others. So for example, another purpose of research could be to explain. So no, no, I don't just want to describe how certain things are taking place. I want to understand causality. I want to understand if there's a correlation between A and B. If something happened uh, that has an effect on something else. So for example, I want to understand if there is a correlation in, uh, rent prices in relation to certain policies of the right to buy too, for example. But I'm not going to describe the process by which that happened. I want to understand the relationship between those two events, those two processes. Normally, there are complete exceptions, but normally when one tries to explain and correlate, there's a lot of quantitative methods involved, meaning there's either statistical components or there's um, uh, regressions or correlations to be established. And less of an anthropological ethnographic set of methods, because they might not necessarily give you the data that you will need to present your research as an explanation of something, right? This is very useful. Example is some of you wanted to understand uh, the thermal efficiency of certain insulation uh, materials, uh, and what you would probably do is to look. Oh, look! If I use this, this is what happens, and I can measure that correlation. The descriptions cannot be measured. Right? They, they, they suppose, and, and they're underpinned by a, a different epistemological foundation. Right? Because the phenomenon that you're trying to address ontologically, so what is that phenomenon, cannot be measured. Levy presents, which I, in my own research, I use quite a lot, which is, which is community change or action, and you can do research on that. Uh, you can potentially introduce research to instigate or promote forms of community activism. Now, this one is a bit more complicated to put in place in the very rigid and almost incredible time frame that you got. I'm mentioning it just because it is possible. Uh, it's way more difficult to achieve a research design that would somehow um, develop community projects based on research, because you need to build up the rapport and alliances with those groups, then develop with them and co-produce the research design, then carry out the, re it, it just, you won't have the time. I have to be entirely honest. 
Another purpose of research could be to evaluate. So for example, you can bypass this community action or change stage and then say, well, actually I wanna look at the impact that a certain action or uh, intervention had on a certain community, location, uh, or organization. And you can use your research to evaluate. Right? So these are different purposes of research. Now, regardless of what the purpose of research is, and this is a, uh, and I'm afraid you're gonna have to live with it. This is a diagram that we we're gonna keep on looking next week and potentially weeks after that, because it's almost a summary of the engine of your dissertation. So regardless of what the purpose of your research is, every research design, and we will talk about research design next week, contains this box, definitions around this box, decisions around this box. So you have your own topic, your own problem of research that allows you to frame a certain set of questions and an argument or a hypothesis around those questions. In order to have a hypothesis, you need to then validate it or invalidate it. And then in order to do that, you need to collect data. So you need methods, you need to analyze it. You need to understand how valid the claims are gonna be in relation to the data that you collected. That has inevitably, because you're gonna be engaging with collecting data, you're gonna have an issue of ethics. Are you gonna engage with vulnerable communities or not? Are you going to have access to the sources or not? Uh, you're going to have clearance or not? And we're going to have a session on ethics because you're going to have to fill out forms uh, for your dissertation, regardless of your um, research design. But I'm not going to get too deep into this because the next week is going to be on this. But I want you to keep an eye out that this is a little bit what you will be working towards for your dissertation. You should be able to literally put content into this diagram uh, when you submit your proposal and when you work towards the first kind of set of iterations of your research project and your dissertation project. And one should be able, when one reads both your abstract and your introduction to your dissertation in May, I should be able to fill out this box very rapidly. Oh, fantastic. And this is the problem of research. This is what they want, basically the research questions, this is what they want to find out. This is how they went about it. So they have a conceptual framework and a set of methods, and this is how they, uh, they went about and did it. Are there any questions so far? No? I'm assuming that you're not out running and there is a, human being behind the 157 number. So I'll continue. Um, let's see if there's... Uh, okay. Uh, okay, excellent, fantastic. Right, why... Uh, how can we get you to start thinking about your questions? Uh, it's not a bad idea that you start writing down and keeping almost a diary or a personal notebook on your dissertation topic and your dissertation project. Uh, it is perfectly possible that you might have an inkling, you might have an interest on a broad theme that probably perhaps is not even a question so I would probably say, before you develop a research question, you need to think about developing a theme, you know, to sit within a broad process or a theme. So uh, I'm interested in looking at the architecture, uh, the relationship between gaming and architecture. Uh, so I wanna look at visual representation and architectural production and through game engines uh, in the last 15 years. Fantastic, okay. So in a way, you don't necessarily went that deep, but you're interested in looking at games and visual representation, or you're interested in looking about looking into a very specific architect that blew your mind, and you really want to take this time an opportunity to actually deepen your understanding. That's absolutely perfect. So you start writing those things down. 
that's the first thing I would suggest that you start doing, you know, sampling broadly speaking, what would be an interest? One strategy is not necessary, but one strategy could be that you start aligning to maximize reading time. Some of the research problems and questions that might emerge from your research methods, one, your options that you've selected or you're about to be assigned, uh, and you start working around them. Um, I know that this is different from the landscape in architecture people, but I think it will work nonetheless, regardless of the options that you're in. Uh, I think, you know, if you're working in your atelier and there are certain concerns and um, questions that you're dealing with, I think it would be wise to maximize your time and try to align interests. Uh, one recommendation is try not to spread too thinly. So if you already, you're, particularly for people in the EMR, if already your methods one is completely different from your atelier topic, don't add a third dimension, you know, because you're going to have to do a lot of reading. You're going to spend a lot of time. And the more you can uh, rework and reuse from your other two uh, courses, I think it will be extremely beneficial. And the same thing, I, I think, goes for uh, the, the, mass, and the landscape and architecture masters. Um, I think that would be wise. This sometimes the first thing that we I think is useful to do is that you start very rapidly from the very beginning trying to understand the issue of feasibility. So perhaps you come up with an idea and say, oh, look, I think what I want to do is to basically look at uh, social movements in slums and the way they build houses. And I'm planning to visit three different slums in three different continents. Okay, that's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. So the, I think the issue of reflecting on the feasibility, doing a feasibility test, realistic one, early on is really important because that might allow you to come up with alternatives really early on. So perhaps it's not looking in depth ethnographically at those processes, but it might be looking at uh, international practices and NGOs and initiatives that you can have access virtually. Is it ideal? No. Is it feasible? Yes. So that um, question about how easy will it be to access that data? How easy will it be to access the archive? How easy will it be to actually conduct the interview? It's really important. If you think that immediately each topic, each big process will require data right? uh, at some point. And so you start, as you start narrowing down your research topic and this potential questions, you need to start thinking about whether you're going to have access to that data. I think the other thing which I think I would strongly recommend is that this exercise of trying to find your topic, trying to think about possible questions, and even imagine where will the information come from to support those claims to answer those questions, is reading. So it might seem counterintuitive, but it's certainly not, is that it will be almost impossible for you to feel comfortable about understanding and refining a topic and even less so to understand the possible questions if you're not deep into reading about that topic. So my suggestion is that aside from trying to engage with the basic kind of textbooks on research methods in architecture, a couple of that I've already mentioned that are already up in the dissertation guideline, that's fine. That's not gonna solve the problem of your own research design. It will give you access to the fundamentals of how you can engage with a research design is to start reading on the topic, right? Uh, so if you're thinking that you're gonna be looking at the impact of, uh, uh, potentially gaming 
in architectural practice, you probably need to start by understanding the implications of the digital turn in architecture. So PCON, for example, you should probably start reading that. Or if you, so each broad theme will have a set of key references and you can get support, the potential uh, atelier leaders, the people working with you in the dissertation methods one, you can ask me if I know, or if I'm close to a certain topic, I will try to give you a hand but start to engage with the key references around your topic. You cannot formulate a proposal if you not situate your proposal within the existing literature of your topic. You, you just can't. You won't be able to formulate the questions. You won't be able to understand that there is a problem. Right? Uh, why is this it's not moving? Okay, sorry. I have to. Uh, this is a little bit a list of concerns that you should probably address when you're thinking about working towards your research design and selecting your topic. We would look in depth about the meaning and content of your research design, but this is more like uh, even before we get to that stage. So. Uh, potentially how you start your basic search to, to formulate the, the margins of a research interest. So are you interested in a theoretical uh, body of work, a certain set of authors that really speak to you and call your attention? Is there a certain set of topics or processes or examples or typologies that actually are the key? Were there a set of films? Were there a set of um, buildings that actually are the beginning of your, uh, or the kernel of your interest? Uh, write them down, make a list. What do you know about it? So, you know, start writing very certain bullet, potentially in bullet points, things that you might be missing and you fill those gaps. Uh, start to understand where you can access data. So potentially as you go along in your reading list, you will find that there are certain journals, academic journals where you can get uh, regular articles published around that topic. So it'd be really important really early on to understand or isolate five or six academic journals that speak directly to your topic. So it's not just books uh, or, or collection of uh, uh, chapters that might be relevant, potentially, more importantly, I would say by 80%, academic journals, which is something that some of you might not be used to, and you should familiarize yourself immediately. So getting your password and your requirements ready because the U of MMM, you have access to amazing data sets. We'll have Elaine Cook coming to the course to give you a much a deeper description as to what kind of data sets you can access from the very beginning access to academic journals is really important so elaine will even take you further that there are specific data sets that both universities pay to give you access to which can provide you with additional data construction indicators building indicators um, etc but apart from that i think you should familiarize yourself with the two three five journals that regularly publish on themes that you're interested in Try to play with the possibility of a timetable. So try to understand the scale and scope of the problem that you're gonna face and try to organize the flow of work, particularly in conjunction with the other responsibilities and commitments and deadlines that you're gonna have. And that is really important. Uh, so you're gonna get additional support specifically from your supervisor, but potentially if you were thinking of trying to deploy a specific method or tactic to collect data that needs to happen in a certain time, you need to be able to actually make that feasible. The deadlines won't move. So you need to be able to create, that's an integral part of your research set, research design, are the practicalities of your research design, but they're really important, particularly on a time scale that you've got, which is really short to produce a dissertation. Let me now go more practical to how we're gonna to try to get you 
to a happy ending uh, in relation to your dissertation. So you'll be working from the end of October, you'll be given like a long list of options of supervisors that would have selected themes and topics uh, to create a dissertation group. We will strive to actually be able to give you your first or second option, and we hopefully will be able to do that. It's not secure, but hopefully we will. So we will strongly encourage you to be A, flexible, but also have a very good look at the list. Uh, there's always a possibility that even if you were really keen on doing something that you thought was aligned with this group, I'm sure that you will be able to use some of the uh, readings and uh, contributions from your option two or three to still tackle the same topic, right? So uh, I'm sure that there is some wiggle room in there. Each group will, as I said, will have its broad research theme that supervisor will organize those group sessions slightly differently. Uh, they might have uh, group sessions from the very beginning but then go into individual sessions. They might all be group. That depends on the supervisor. They will be supported by a set of key readings to address that broad topic. That might help. So in a way, it might give you a jump start on uh, what will be your literature review, which I will speak briefly about. Um, and the aim is very rapidly for you towards the end of October to align you with that dissertation group around a proposal. So this is a template of the proposal of what we will ask you to have ready. It will change. It's not final. It's not something that you need to stick to, but it will be fundamental for you to start working from day one in your dissertation group to have a working proposal so that it's uh, it shows that you've already tried to understand the theme, try to understand the key questions that you would like to address, potentially thought of how you're going to collect the data. So how, where are your resources going to come from? What is your basic kind of uh, epistemological principles or set of methodological decisions? Uh, and make a list of the key references that you've read already. So it's not long what we ask you to produce for the proposal, but it, it will allow your supervisor to very quickly get to grips with where you're at, to send you to read the things that you might need to read, but also start reworking your research design and your questions. I wanted to, to start having an understanding or a broad idea about what the dissertation uh, will look like and what will it entail. And we will almost tackle each of these chapters of your dissertation separately in each of the sessions. So today we almost gave uh, the ground zero general introduction to basic concerns as to why do we need a dissertation, what is a dissertation. But from session two and onwards, we will look at the research design, which allow us to understand what a literature review might be, which is session three. We will look at methods in, I think, in session four and five. So each of these um, chapters of the dissertation, uh, we will look at in, uh, in the different sessions. Now, this is a generic, yours might be slightly different, a table of contents. So you're gonna have, uh, you need to submit, I think, a, 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 a copyright declaration. You will have a title. Uh, the title should not be a sentence, uh, a full sentence that like it's like a hundred words long. Uh, it should be concise, precise, speak directly to your topic and almost give a hint about your uh, research question. The, the, the table of contents will show... Uh, we will all ask, we'll ask you all to produce an abstract. The abstract should be about 250, 300, 300, 300, 300 words. Uh, the introduction should have, and this is slightly when you, you can start uh, having some differences, but your introduction uh, should lay out your interest as to why you picked that topic. You describe the chapter structure. So each of the structures each of the chapters you described in the introduction. So you say this introduction, this dissertation argues this, it claims this, it is supported 
by this set of sources, uh, and this is the main contribution. And then you say, in chapter two, I do this. In chapter three, I do that. And you basically give an, a detailed summary of the entire dissertation. Here is, you know, there are certain differences. Some students can introduce the methods chapter or section, subsection directly in the introduction if it's really small and direct. Others will choose to actually do that in a separate chapter. So basically, this methods chapter can be included in the introduction or it can be taken separately. And if it's taken as a separate chapter, I will put it after the literature review. If it's included in the introduction, it's embedded in as a subsection. After your introduction, you will have your literature review, which you can call something else, but it's basically your ability to contextualize your research design and your problem and your dissertation within the existing literature that relates to your topic. So the key conceptual blocks of your dissertation are explored in the literature review. And you say basically how you're understanding the key concepts of your dissertation, but how you situate yourself within that existing literature and whether you think that your dissertation is going to directly tackle a gap that exists within the literature or whether you're gonna borrow and follow a certain set of uh, um, uh, examples or uh, uh, contributions that already exist, but you need to detail them. And what we want is not a list of the things you've read. The literature review, as we will see in session three, is not a list of the things you've read. It's an analysis, a critical analysis of the sources related to your topic. And this, you will see that it refers to your key concepts and topics or processes and not your case. So we don't ask you if you're working in a specific case in the Northern Quarter, the literature review is not everything that was written on the Northern Quarter because most likely you're gonna be looking at a process. But we want more what the literature, the academic literature has said, for example, on uh, the creative class uh, and gentrification. That's most likely is going to be the set of nodes of your dissertation in that case, not so much what's been written on the non quarter, which you can add as a separate subsection, but it's not that. So it's not a list of what you've read and it's not uh, a description of what's been written on your specific case. It's more a conceptual definition of the key terms of your dissertation and a contextualization of your uh, dissertation and the arrangement of your conceptual framework for your dissertation. After that, you can have either the separate methodological chapter, if it's not included in the introduction as a subsection. So this one will move to here if it's a separate one. And here what we want is a description of how you collected the data, what were the decisions behind the collection of that data? In what ways you think that the data or the sources and the resources that you will, yeah, you've collected are valid in relation to the claims that you want to make? And so we want certain definitions as to the quality of the instrument that you use to collect the data. So, for example, if you are thinking that you're going to use uh, interviews, how you arrange the interviews, why you selected those persons. How were those persons selected? If you did map analysis, why map analysis is important for your topic? So, so almost the engine room of the decisions that you took to collect and gather the sources is mainly what we want in the methods chapter. After that first part of the dissertation, which could clearly be divided in up to here. Uh, so I think I can... Uh, up to here, uh, we enter into what's called the empirical section of your dissertation. Now, this section can have two, three chapters. Uh, that depends. And it's basically an attempt to take forward the conceptual apparatus that you've developed here and see how you are able to analyze the data you've collected with the methods that you selected to answer the questions that you set out in the introduction. So you see that the dissertation acts as a logical box. Everything is entangled, right? 
And in a way, you should think about each of the empirical chapters as ways of thinking how they answer certain questions. Right? Look, in chapter four, I tackle this element of the question that I set out to investigate, certain dimension, which is complemented with the next empirical chapter, chapter five, that tackles this other aspect. They don't just need to be related to the overall question of your dissertation. They also need to be related between themselves, right? They need to work in tandem. They cannot be completely isolated. There needs to be a, a logical flow to your chapters. This part, the conclusions can be slightly different in the sense that some people like to have a discussion chapter of the empirical section before the conclusion. Others want to join everything together and have the conclusions all together. That will depend a lot on your supervisor. There's nothing wrong to that. But roughly speaking, we enter into the conclusion section. So either you have a separate conclusion to the empirical chapters uh, where you analyze the key findings uh, of each of the empirical sections. And then the conclusions brings together the entire apparatus of the dissertation. So the a connection with the conceptual framework, whether it was appropriate, whether it was limited. And one of the things that we want you to highlight in the conclusion. It's almost the limitations you faced. In this case, particularly, we don't know in what ways, but potentially there's still gonna be side effects of the pandemic. So there might be limitations that look, I would have liked to do this, but I couldn't. And that's where you write it in the conclusion. So, well, look, I think looking at the results of my dissertation, I think if I had more uh, time or the ability to visit certain places, I would certainly have complemented these sources with that. So the limitations of your research. The other things that it's nice to include, apart from an absolute summary of the, the, the chapters of your dissertation. So you will start feeling that there's a little bit of a repetition going on, but it's a little bit working towards that. It's the idea of uh, further research. So one thing that it's appropriate to have in the conclusions of your dissertation is, okay, how can you take this findings, this set of findings, this research further. So building on what you've done, you can say that I think the next step would clearly be to escalate this piece of research or to look at a different side of the phenomenon or to look at a different time period or to compare. But it's nice. And what we, the reason why we want you to write that is because you can only think about how you can extend research if you've done it properly. And that's really important for us because we find that you're confident in the things you found that can serve as a platform for the next stage of research. So it's not so much that we want to look at your next proposal, it's whether you're understanding the implications of what you did. Uh, and then we have the bibliography. This is really important that you're systematic, that you use the Harvard referencing suggestions and systems that, it's, that are outlined in the MMU handbook. So if you look, if you Google MMU Harvard referencing, you'll get exactly the guide, follow it. Uh, for certain cases, particularly if we are looking at heavy archival dissertation or archival based dissertation that relate more to his, his history forms of methods, uh, we could, uh, we will certainly accept the, the Chicago system and the footnote system, it's absolutely fine. Uh, there's not a problem with the system, is the consistency. So if you pick one, you stick with it throughout with no gaps or changes, slight changes in the middle. The appendixes are important because they give us an opportunity to almost have a look at the engine room of your dissertation. So for example, here is where, the, where you will, we will ask you to transcribe your interviews and to put them in the back. So it's an, almost showing us the evidence of, of, of your methods. You know, so the sources are there. So for example, if you looked at different drawings and you didn't want to include all of them in, in, in the body of work, but you can add an extra set of sample uh, material as an appendix. If you wanted us to look at um, data sets that were not necessarily thickly included in the body of work, but you wanna suggest that th there's more to where some of the uh, quotes came from, then you can include that at the back. 
the word count of the appendix do not count to the overall word count of your dissertation, which at the moment stands at 10,000 words, right? So that's important. So what, what the transcription of your interviews do not count for your word, uh, your word count. Any, any questions about this? Hello, Ooh, am I? No. Okay, let's stop drawing. Uh, uh, let me see if I can move. Sharing is pause. I didn't want to do that. Okay. Resume share. Okay, here we go. Uh, annotate clear all drawings good here we go uh the assessment uh and i know we're jumping ahead but i think it's important that you understand what we're going to be looking at and how we're going to assess your dissertation we're going to look at the quality and integrity uh, of your research design. So we're gonna basically see if you are capable of aligning a research topic with a problem of research, with a set of questions and reasonable and manageable and valid set of uh, methodological decisions. One, we're gonna look at how well you manage to contextualize your topic within the existing literature. So the literature review chapter is really important. It's one of the elements of assessment. Uh, we're going to look at how well you've organized the writing of your dissertation in terms of the logical progression of your argument. So we don't want to see massive jumps that go back and forth and the argument come from nowhere. We want to see a logical progression of your argument that builds, right? So that the dissertation sets out what you're going to do and you actually do it. So if you see a discrepancy, a massive discrepancy between what you said in the dissertation that you were going to do and then you didn't have the time or you didn't do it, then there is a problem. And then another thing that we truly value is not only how well it's written, how consistently it's referenced, but also how well visually supported your dissertation is. So this is an architectural dissertation in the end. So we want you to be able to embed visual component into your analysis. That doesn't mean that you need to get drawing or that you need to select a topic that is necessarily looking at an architect, but it is visually supported, right? And again, this is not how many drawings you can put in the dissertation. It's about how well you can embed them and use them to develop your argument, right? So two different things. Those are the um, blocks of assessment that we, we as markers will have to fill. Right. Well, when you see your feedback sheet, it will be divided into these sets of uh, um, assessment points. Just to remind you, but of course you would have seen this in the guidelines, your dissertation is double marked. So it's marked by um, your first marker will be someone that is not your supervisor. Your second mark is by your supervisor. They will reach an average, an agreement, and if there's not an agreement within 10 point difference, it will be third marked, right? And someone else would almost draw the Salomonic line of who was right uh, between these two marks if there's a substantial discrepancy. Um, and you will still be step marked. These are some links that I put up in terms of architectural, specifically architectural research. Uh, methods uh, are directly linked to the University of Manchester Library, and you can find them there. Are there any any questions? Doubts? Okay. Um, the bibliography. I'm looking at the chat now. So sorry. I, now, uh, the bibliography does count. There, there is a tolerance of 10% if you need to go over. Uh, but in terms of the work count, what it is really important is that you basically, from the beginning, you think about the scale of your dissertation, you think about your research design. So you shouldn't 
be faced with a problem that your dissertation is getting closer to 25,000 words, I so, still, um, I might need to go over. Uh, that speaks of a badly arranged research design, right? Uh, so it's really important that you, when you sketch out the structure of your dissertation, when we looked at the abstract, and one of the things I suggest to my students as they move along the supervisory process is that they start potentially drafting uh, versions of the table of contents right, to see how the chapters will look like and to provide a brief description of what is in each, what would be in each of those chapters to see whether that makes sense and potentially then make a decision as to um, what needs to be cut. And you read some good dissertations for us. Uh, yes, I can, uh, I presume that you want us to suggest some dissertations. Yes, uh, there will be some dissertations the dissertations are in the library, but there will be some dissertations that I can put up uh, and I can share so, so you can have a look at. Um, absolutely. It says you can have a smaller word count. If you, yes. I'm answering another question by uh, someone in the chat. Yes, there is a possibility of using design to reduce the word count. Now that has to be properly supervised in your dissertation group because the design component then has to be pro properly justified within the research design. What do I mean by this? So it's not like you can basically write less and then complement with a set of nice drawings. The drawings themselves need to be entangled within the process of research. So whether you were working towards a, a research design that was heavily linked to prototyping, whether you were looking at the evolution of a prototype, whether you were looking at um, uh, uh, testing certain parameters along around a design, that will count. But that has to be properly justified in a research design. So yes, uh, there is a... Uh, a possibility of reducing the work count with a heavier component of this time, but that is not what I refer to as visual support for your claims. Design then is an integral part of the research process. Uh, and I think you can still do it, but uh, it will certainly be something that you need to discuss as soon as November with your supervisor when you get assigned one. Do we choose our, uh, sorry, I'm trying to, you know, there are several questions I'm trying to go through it. Uh, or do we get allocated? No, you will be given all the lists of um, groups. This is, sorry, this is for MARC, not for landscape and architecture. You're not going to be put into groups. Uh, this is for the MARC people. Um, you will see a set of uh, options uh, and a list and a brief description of the topics. And then you're going to be given, like in the atelier, the possibility of selecting, I think, your top three choices. Uh, and then you'll be allocated, uh, hopefully, to your top three choices. Is there a limit to the number and type of paper citations or no limitation? There's no limitations. Uh, what it is important, and I will, uh, we will talk more in depth, potentially when we look at literature review, which is the heaviest section of uh, uh, referencing that you will engage with. It's the issue of plagiarism. So there's absolutely no limit as to how many sources you can include or even how many quotes you can use. What, there is an absolute, and there has to be absolute clarity that plagiarism in any way or form will not be tolerated. So the possibility you say, well, I forgot to put the quotation marks, that won't fly. And you need, we will have a um, big discussion on plagiarism because I'm aware that this is, put, so for some of you, it might be the first time that you engage in an academic piece of writing, but your dissertations will go through, turn it in, and they will give us a score. And we are really, for us, it's really easy to check whether bits of your dissertation have come from somewhere else. So I know that the question refers to academic referencing, but I just wanted to slip in the plagiarism one. In terms of the actual references, there's no limits. 
what you should be able to balance and check, and when you submit drafts to your supervisor, they will be able to comment on this, is sometimes if you include too many quotes, then it be, and without any form of critical analysis of the quotes you introduce, you lose your critical ability to structure the argument. So what we don't want is almost like a collection of quotes that ends up with a little discussion at the end. Basically, there's nothing inherently wrong with the quote is that you will be assessed poorly because of your lack of analysis. I uh, hope I make myself clear on that. We will choose what do you recommend we do from this point on? Shall we start reading and develop? Yes. From this point on, you should start thinking about potential themes. I know that you know it's really early on for your ateliers and your research uh, methods, but I think this is a humble suggestion. For those of you who have not yet a, a very strong uh, kind of inclination as to the type of topic that they would like to choose, to start listing potential ideas, but I would try to link them with your atelier or your research methods course. It would be amazing if you can combine them. You know, there will be an element that you can dig deeper into the research methods one or the atelier. And the reason why I'm saying this is that to maximize the readings. Potentially, uh, I'm generalizing, I know that this might not be for everyone, but there might is likely that you were assigned to a research method course that was of your interest. And there is likely that within the reading list of that research method course, there'll be something that you're interested in. Um, that will be a good starting point. The rest is to make a list of your topics and the key readings that you can find on the topics. Forget about the question for now. Think about the themes, topics, processes. It could be potentially you can start from a case study. Look, I'm actually obsessed by the construction of the logistical city in Dubai. I just, you know, I saw it and I can't stop thinking about it. Okay, well, start reading not only on your case, but then you clearly then will need to move into studying critical logistical studies, right? So it's moving away from your case more into a conceptual and the conceptual framework. But you can start from either end, right? So some of you might really be, you know, would have been exposed to a research methods where you were uh, exposed to a th uh, body of theoretical work for the first time. So maybe some of you will start with, from the theoretical point of view. That's, fi that's fine as well. One of the things, before I get to the next question, one of the things I would like, I would strongly suggest is that very early on, as of today, that you pick a reference manager system. Whether you want to use um, EndNote, whether you want to use Sotero, whether you want to use um, uh, Envivo, it doesn't matter. Uh, whether you want to use cards, written cards, I, you know, personal choice, but do it now. So everything that you read, everything that you watch, everything that you attend, every reference that might have someone thrown into a lecture, you write it down and you reference it, right? So it's what, what I mean, Sotero and EndNote are reference managers. Envivo is more like an analysis reference system. Uh, so it allows you to code. So it's it potentially, what well, EndNote would allow you to do that, but it's a, a bit more complex, but it doesn't matter. What I mean is that everything that you come across, that you start building your own reference list right, from the very beginning. EndNote would allow you even to generate, and Sotero would as well, and Sotero I think is a free plugin. And EndNote is included as a student, certainly at U of M, but you can basically generate a bibliography at the end. So you hit end, you include it in Word, you know, you don't need to worry about formatting, for example, but only if you start doing it from the very beginning and you don't start panicking in May when you're missing references and you can't find it where you read something, that's really annoying. Should we have already decided on a dissertation topic because a no? Oh, before we meet our groups. Well, what I would say is that each group will, the for this year, for the first time, the dates of the meetings are scheduled, pre-scheduled. Before last year, it was up to each supervisor. There might be variations. Some, some supervisors might not meet exactly on that date and there's absolutely no, no, no problem. But what we do want you is to get to the first meeting with your supervisor 
with a proposal. So my suggestion, my strong suggestion will be that you work towards the 26th of October and the beginning of November when you need to, the 26th you select your groups. So a few days after that, the most that you have your uh, uh, proposal ready because the supervisor will ask you to submit your proposal for the first meeting just to have a look at what you where you're at right the idea is not to start from scratch now i understand that what you might think is well you know look why am i doing that there might be very strong variations uh from the moment i get assigned my group because it might not be the first choice and i you know i understand it but it would still be really helpful to have a clearer view of what you're interested in and what you've been reading because then within the group that you are effectively in there can be uh, ways of accommodating your interests for the bibliography are we using mmu Harvard? yes we are using mmu harvard style i will upload a link but it's already available uh, on the mmu website you can if you google mmu harvard style referencing you download it uh, Joe is saying where the landscape architects uh, will meet. Uh, anything else? Where are there be? Well, this is a, a good question. So someone is asking if you can basically continue or expand your undergraduate dissertation if you were in a university where you needed to do one there's absolutely no reason why you cannot keep working on the same topic what would be definitely ill-advised is if you basically do very little else from your undergrad because that will be on tenet in and we'll find it so one of the things that we would strongly encourage and this is something that you can definitely work with your supervisor or i can have a look at and give you give you a hand is that you uh, show a clear point of departure from your dissertation either because of the scale of the work or because of the uh, time period that you're analyzing or because you are including a different set of sources or methods to collect additional forms of data that were definitely not present in your undergrad dissertation, that would make a clear change. But there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't further uh, your, your study. Would there be issue? Okay, that's answered. Anyone else? Uh, no. Uh, for MA architecture, yeah, okay, they will be able to discuss the initials. Okay, so that's Lucy, sorry. Um, sorry, this one, because it was a bit more practical, had a lot to do with AMR students, but uh, for next session onwards, it's how to do a research design and that should apply, that should apply to everyone and we won't get into the ins and outs of the practicalities of the dissertation. Anyone else? When it's released so we could, there, we were looking at doing it roughly by around mid-October. Um, so that's when the full list, and I've allocated in the session time to go over some of the themes. So, you know, because they were presented in bullet points and with the title and the name of the supervisor, I will take some time to actually give you an overview of what those topics might be and what kind of potential dissertations you could think of in each of those uh, topics. You have a similar topic to our research method. Yes, it can be. Now, that's why AI encouraged that, but also I made a strong point in thinking that potentially the outputs that will be asked to do for your methods will be radically different from the dissertation. So absolutely, I will maximize the reading time uh, and the sources I will be asked to look at in your research method one, but the type of output that you'll be asked in this decision is radically different, but absolutely you can. And I will encourage it. I, I think that will make your life easier. 
definitely. Anyone else? A lot of things I mentioned today will make more sense um, next week when we look at the research design session. Uh, we'll, you know, he, how to frame your question, how to think about your theme will, will start to become clear next week. Can the dissertation be of a similar topic? Yes, it can, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, again, the output will be radically different. It will not look like a portfolio. So you don't think that you can, uh, there will be almost very little that you can take from the portfolio, but there will be a lot of the readings that you potentially you would have done for your topic or the exploration that you would have done at the atelier that you can deepen with your research. And I think it will also help your portfolio work. So I think in that sense, I would also strongly encourage it. Even if you end up with a dissertation group that is not related neither to your um, tutor and research method once or your atelier, it doesn't matter because the themes might be connected or you can find the connection, right? Right. Anyone else? No. Um, can we, no, one, no, two. If not, uh, I shall see you um, next Tuesday. Uh, I will be potentially not this week, but as of now, next week, having my office hours in humanities speech for street building room 1.7 uh i might because of the size of this class i might ask you to drop me a quick line the day before just to see whether i'm expecting none or 20 and if i'm expecting 20 then i'll probably create like a timetable so you don't have to queue outside uh, to make it easier easier for you Great guys, thank you for tolerating this um, virtual um, session. I uh, look forward to seeing you next week and I'll put up the recording link uh, as soon as it's ready on the cloud um, in Zoom. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leandro. Bye. Take care, take care everybody. Thank you, have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Let's see how you stop the recording. Recording stopped.